You may have noticed um, in the course of things how some habits of mind or predilections or predispositions just seem to run in families. My family seems to have been predisposed towards a fascination with communication technologies like, well, the webcam we've got going on here today. My father, for, for instance, built radios for Westinghouse before the war, operated on them during the war. For someone born in 1919, as he was, it was endlessly fascinating and essential to living in the world. It was the internet of his day. He passed this fascination on to my elder brother, who was in on the ground floor, as they say, of IBM in the 1960s, at the very vanguard of personal computers that have remade the society and culture of our world in recent decades, until he gave it up to become an actor. <laughs> ah, well, even smart guys make bad calls once in a while. His second son, me, did TV and radio and film, and eventually became a lecturer in media studies until recently. And even my daughter, Rosie, could, with her uh, MacBook, find a wireless hotspot on the dark side of the moon, I'm convinced. All the better to network with her friends via Skype and MSN Messenger. What's going on here? Why has this been passed on to us like a disease? Some habits do just run in families. And in this case, I think the habit of mind is not so much about the technology as it is about a kind of inchoate yearning for greater communication and connection through ever newer and more immediate means, a progression from radio to Skype in just two generations. I was puzzling on this strange patrimony earlier this year when in preparation to be interviewed for ministerial training, I reflected on how my religious sensibilities developed out of my life experience. In searching my past, I found a key turning point, one of those epiphanies I'd like to share with you today. And it wasn't anything to do with my Catholic upbringing. It wasn't to do with a priest or a night in the dark woods or a book or a movie or a teacher or a kindly neighbor that I found pivotal. It was my fourth grade science project. For you see, my dad, who remember built radios, suggested that I build a crystal radio set for the science project, by which, as every parent, every parent here knows, meant that he'd build it while I watched. <laughs> it was a simple trick, he assured me. And that this project would wow my friends and teachers, make me eternally popular, and teach me a few things about, quote, the way things worked. Only the last of those outcomes actually happened. The way this thing, this crystal radio set, worked was kind of through a kind of alchemy of found objects. Scrap, mostly. Copper wire uh, wound around a cardboard tube, a strip of aluminum, some screws, all of it anchored to an old off-cut of wood. There are also some magical bits, too. An old set of World War II headphones, liberated, no doubt, from one of the ships my father served on. And another thing, most strange, special, and significant, a little piece of rock crystal called a diode, which even at the time I thought was a wonderful Greek-sounding name like a demigod, you know, the demigod diode. Thrown together, these objects, it seemed to me in no compelling order, this mass of scraps and the magic bit on the block of wood he attached by wires to our basement water pipes, which my dad assured me meant it was grounded. And bear in mind, there is no electricity at all in this construction and it's as dead as earth, but only by being earthed could it work. So I slipped on the dusty Bakelite headphones and listened while he moved the aluminum strip up and down the copper coil. And I remember thinking, how can this be like the thing we have in the car? <laughs> I mean, this will never fly, Orville. But then, sure enough, through the weird synthesizer-like whirs and yelps came WCAO, Radio Baltimore. No current, no knobs, no lights, no tubes. Metal, wood, and rock, and I could hear the music. Later, I took the crystal set up to, the, up to my room at the top of our house, and I hooked it to my radiator pipes and explored the universe of amplitude modulation, or AM. 
I tuned into places with exotic sounding names like Moose Jaw, Medicine Hat, and on clear nights, Mexico City and French speaking Montreal, strange places, foreign tongues, talking to each other, singing to each other, buying and selling and praying and evangelizing. This clump of scrap was a big bang to my sense of the size of the world, but that's not really the point I wish to make. I was a curious little tyke, and I wanted to know how the voices I could hear from near and far got into the headphones. Where were these voices? And why could I not see or hear or sense them without this magical device, I asked my dad. Now, my father was handy, but he was no physicist. And yet he was able to assure me of this, that these voices, voices were frequencies, waves in the air, these invisible waves in space, and that these frequencies are being broadcast, are out there in the ether all the time, that they're able to move like ghosts through houses and buildings and cars and, yes, even people. They're everywhere, and all you need to know is the trick of capturing them, in this case, through the crystal radio set. And so it became clear to me through that crystal set that there were more things in heaven and earth than I could ever know about. This thought matured later into a simple logical premise, that not being able to perceive something doesn't mean it's not there. That absence of evidence does not necessarily equal evidence of absence. Examples abound. The perceptual system of dogs, as we know, can hear frequencies we're deaf to. Bees can perceive ultraviolet light and magnetic fields, which we are blind to. And the radio waves my father's crystal set captured and made intelligible was really just an extension of my own limited human sense apparatus. It was and is humbling to think that merely being human, with a human's limited ability to receive many kinds of signals, draws effectively a veil across much of creation. That is, for good or ill, how things work. So the reason the crystal set stayed with me all these 40 plus years is that it reminds me of a fundamental truth, that the universe or God or what you will is transmitting on all frequencies, at all times, in all places. The problem we mere humans have is how to master the trick of tuning our receivers to hear more of it. This too is how things work. There are many channels through which we may pick up God or the universe or what you will's broadcasts. Through thoughts, especially clear, reasoned thoughts so prized in the Unitarian tradition. Or through our five senses, be it through the caress of a loved one, a cool wind in summer, a warm bath. Or through feelings, too. Sometimes the unutterable beauty of a piece of music that moves us to tears or awe. Righteous indignation at injustice or love. Perhaps all these channels of thought and feeling and sense can be more broadly referred to as just experiences, things that happen to you in this life and how you choose to engage with them. Experiences of art and beauty, intellectual breakthroughs and struggles, or the passions that may prompt you to do thus or such. Whichever of these channels we choose to focus our attention on, and it is a choice, our preferred channel is not and can never be the whole story. Valid connection with the universe or God or what you will can and does happen in many ways since all our individual receivers, our individual consciousnesses are tuned slightly differently one from another. And overarching these individual differences are more powerful and subtle ones. For example, that our culture shapes us to receive only a certain range of frequencies, and that just being human, just one part of creation, narrows our range of frequencies too. This too is how things work. To stretch the conceit just one bit further, I think of humans like AM receivers in a universe that includes FM, shortwave, medium wave, long wave, CB, police, fire, shipping vans, airplane frequencies, and on and on, layer upon layer, an infinity of possible frequencies. And so it's no wonder that humans with their limited reception 
may have a hard time of it, may feel in their darker moments that creation itself is impoverished merely because our experience of it is, may search the dial end to end for insight, not knowing that it is our narrow bandwidth that restricts us, 